Hello everyone. This is a quick presentation about wavelets and their use in feature extraction. So let's start. Um, to start with the analysis of wavelets, we have to understand three basic components. These are time domain representations, frequency domain representations, and time frequency domain representations. So let's start with the time domain. Um, in Wikipedia, time domain refers to the analysis of mathematical functions, physical signals, or time series of economic or environmental data with respect to time. In our analysis, when we start thinking about these kind of analysis for feature extraction, we have to simplify the concept. So think about the time domain um, as if you are waiting on the like um, train platform waiting for your train basically. So imagine that you are standing in your train station, whatever that is. And let's say that you are observing the number of people from the bridge. There's usually a number of platforms and there are bridges to allow you to move between the platforms. So imagine that you are looking from far away while you are on the bridge and looking at the number of people on the platform. Um, individually, you can't really recognize every single one of them. You can just see that there are a group of them at every few meters here and there. So if I want to like plot the density of the number of people, as you can see on this photo, I can simply sketch something that looks like this. I can't tell who is who. I can just see a rough estimate of their density. I can see two of them um, in the start three over there and a number of people after that. So I know the number of people within each segment at the given time, but I can't tell who will take which seat when they go on in the train. I can build a time domain um, signal roughly um, sketched for you, like on this graph, as you can see, and I can bring that over here for you on the x-axis. And this is roughly the representation of the number of people on the platform. Again, remember, you don't know um, like which seat is each one of these guys or ladies are going to take inside the train. So when they hop on the train, which seat is this guy, for example, going to take? You don't know that. You just know that there are a number of people over there. You have no idea about them. You can't tell which seat are there, each one of them is going to take. You can just see their density. That's the time domain. And this is what I'm showing you over here. Let's move on to the frequency domain. While you are inside the platform, or sorry, inside the carriage, inside the train, you can see the number of people sitting over there. You can see all the seats because you are inside the train. And you can see who's sitting in which seat. So Wikipedia defines the frequency domain as the analysis of mathematical functions or signals with respect to frequency rather than time. So again, um, let's think about the, let's say, um, seats uh, as individual locations, which they are basically, and there will be different people sitting in these seats. Some of them might be taller, than others, some of them might be shorter, some of the seats might be empty. So we, in the frequency analysis or the frequency domain, what we have usually is something called the power spectrum. So in this case, by looking at the number of people over here, I know the number of people um, within each segment, okay, at the given time, where each, where each one is sitting and their heights. However, my main problem over here, while I'm inside the train, I don't know when did each one of them come inside the train. Like when did they uh, enter the, uh, the train, each one of them? I don't really know that. I just saw them sitting over there. When did each of them like hop inside? I have no idea. I can't track that. So from the frequency domain, you can see who's taken which seat. You have no idea at which time did each one of them take his or her seat? So in the frequency domain, we have something called the power spectrum. 
the power spectrum, think about it as if it's made of seats. So a seat for the first frequency, a seat for the second frequency, third, and so on, depending on the sampling frequency. So you will have a number of seats, and there will be a number of people sitting in these seats or taking these seats. The height of the people will be different because each one of us is unique. So there will be different heights for the different frequencies. So think of people as the number, like the frequencies, and the seats are the like discrete locations. So that's what you have over here, a representation of that. So remember, from outside the train, you don't know who's going to take which seat. From inside the train, you know exactly who's taken which seat, but you have no idea when did each one of them come in inside the train, and that's missing. So we need a third representation, which is called the time frequency domain. So if we look at the time frequency domain, you can simply think of it in terms of the, um, let's say, the people who stand in between. So usually, if you have noticed while traveling on the train, there are always people um, standing beside the door. So what those guys can do by standing beside the door, um, if I'm standing beside the door, basically, I can see every single person going inside the train. And I know when did he or she um, enter the train. But the, and I've, like at the same time, I can see where they are going to sit. So by standing near the door, I can see who came in first and which seat did he or she take. So that's the beauty of the time frequency analysis and the resemblance with the, um, let's say, trend journey. So time frequency analysis comprises those techniques that study a signal in both the time and frequency domains simultaneously using various time frequency representations. And today we are going to talk about one of these representations for time frequency analysis, which is called the wavelet or the wavelet transform. Usually, um, I'm pretty sure most of you have seen these kind of images um, where you have the time domain and the frequency domain. So you have the time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and the different colors are a representation of the power. And this is basically what you feed to the deep neural networks when training them based on signals. So let's have a closer look. So wavelets, what are these wavelets? So um, to understand wavelets, you have to understand first that an important aspect of many signals, including biomedical signals, which are the main focus for myself, so is that the information of interest is often a combination of phenomena that are transient and diffuse. These phenomena, uh, phenomena are characterized by the local information that exists in the time domain, frequency domain, or both. So for us to analyze such signals, there is a need for methods that are sufficiently versatile to capture events that present these extremes by localizing information from a time frequency point of view. One of the um, tools that is heavily utilized in the field of, let's say, brain computer inf interfaces or neural devices, let's say in general, neural interfaces, include the wavelets, wavelet transform basically, and the wavelet packet transform. So let's understand more about it. So remember in the old days where FFT, used to employ, uh, which basically still employs. So FFT employs sine and cosine to decompose any signal into a number or infinite number of sines and cosines. And this is a representation of the uh, Fourier series that the FFT is based on, basically. Similarly to that, we have the wavelets also employing some sort of functions. But instead of sine and cosine that we use within the Fourier transformation, as you can see over here, basically, what Fourier does, it says that there's a constant value, DC level, plus an infinite summation of the cosines and sines. And then it figures out the different frequencies because each of these uh, sines and cosines will come at a certain frequency. So similarly to that idea, the idea of decomposing a signal into an endless and infinite number of sines and cosines, wavelets also try to emulate that process. How? By employing 
something called the wavelet functions. So instead of sines and cosines, what we really employ over here are called the father wavelets and the mother wavelets. So wavelets, they come in families. So you can see a lot of different wavelet names like Simlet, Dobechis, and many others. So there's an endless number of wavelet families. They are all made of a father and a mother. So similarly to FFT or Fourier analysis, let's say in general, you can decompose a signal into a number of components. So as you can see over here, um, these are the father wavelets and the mother wavelets. So if I want to decompose that function further, you can see there's like, by the time you finish decomposing the signal, there is only one father representation and a number of mother or wavelet functions, representations. Why is that? I'll show you in a while. So the wavelet functions or simply wavelets, as I said, they have a gender. They come as a family of father wavelets and mother wavelets. So the father wavelet itself is constructed from a mother wavelet by dilating the mother wavelet. So think about it just like human beings, a family where there's a father and there is a mother and the father himself, he came from another mother, basically. That's the general idea. Dilating the mother wavelet produces a low frequency father wavelet that maps into uh, onto a low frequency region of the signal. Um, basically, what we are trying to say, if you hold the two ends of a signal, stretch it out, it's like you are slowing the signal. So dilating a signal creates a father wavelet. So father will be what? Responsible for representing the low frequency components. A mother wavelet will be representative of higher frequency components. So a father wavelet is good at representing smooth and low frequency parts of the signal. And the mother wavelet is good at representing the detail and high frequency parts of a signal. So if you wanna remember this, always remember that the pitch of man vo uh, man's voice fall under low frequency while a woman's voice is of higher pitch type usually. And this is basic science. So wavelets, can be uh, utilized to decompose any signal into a, let's say, low frequency component or low pass filter, and what a high frequency component, which is the high pass filter. So basically what I'm going to do is to employ the families of wavelets or the specific family of wavelet that I have chosen for my analysis. I'm going to employ its father and its mother to produce new families. So what am I talking about? Let's dive in. First of all, these kind of graphs, I want you to be familiar with these. Don't let these kind of graphs scare you. Basically what they are saying over here, if you are not really familiar with these kind of like analysis, you just started your PhD or master, all what this graph is saying that this is the original signal. We decompose the original signal into two components the low pass filter, the high pass filter. And what we get out of these filtering processes are called the approximation coefficients when you do the low pass filtering and the details coefficients when you do the high pass filtering. And there's a um, scaling down by a factor of two. What does that mean? I'll show you in a while, just give me a sec. Further to that, you can keep decomposing. So creating more families. So I don't want to bother you with these graphs. Let, let's go to something much simpler. So if I have a signal, and let's say this is the frequency content of that signal. By decomposing that signal using wavelets into a low pass part and a high pass part, what you have done actually by using wavelets, you are actually dividing the frequency content into two parts, as you can see over here. So basically, if you look at the original um, frequency content, at this level, after doing these, like low pass and high pass filtering, you have actually 
um, divided the original spectrum into almost um, two halves, like equivalent of size. I mean, almost equivalent of size, but they are two sides, two parts. Then what we do with the wavelet analysis is that we decompose the low pass part again, not the high pass pass, only the low pass filter part. We decompose it again into another low pass and high pass. So if you can look at the um, generated spectrum, so originally you had a whole block, then you divided the whole block into two parts, and then you further divided the left part into another two blocks. So what you are really doing is that you keep decomposing the left side only. So again, another time you decompose the signal, you will also apply a low pass filter and a high pass filter and then you decompose further. So eventually, if the bandwidth of each of the smaller ones is called like B, then this is 2B and this is four times B. What does this mean? Let's go and simplify further. Let's assume one um, intuitive example, especially for those who work on um, BCI or brain computer interfacing, working with EEG signals. So I'll show you one example over here where usually there are a number of sensors on your brain or your scalp measuring the EEG activity or signal. So the EEG refers to the electroencephalogram. So let's assume that we are sampling with 256 hertz. So if you sample at 256 hertz, according to Nyquist criteria, the highest frequency in your signal is what? Half of that. It's 128. So let's start decomposing this signal by using the wavelet analysis or the wavelet transform. The first step, as I said, will be a low pass filter that will divide the frequency contents by almost half. And the other part of the analysis include a high pass filter. So instead of the 128 hertz, now you have a signal that is focused on the frequency range of 0 to 64, and another one, another signal over here, that is focused on the range of 64 to 128. So you basically divide it by half. What we do then, if this is not enough for me, I want more decompositions, I want more control. So I will tell you in a while why we keep decomposing. The idea here is that you keep decomposing until some level and then you stop decomposing. But why do I need that? Let me continue first. The next step is what? Another low pass filter and another high pass filter. So as I said, they come in family, families. So the first family um, divided the spectrum for me into two halves, zero to 64, 64 to 128 hertz. The next family, further divided the 0 to 64 into 0 to 32 hertz, and the other one, 32 to 64 hertz. Keep dividing, bring me another family. That will be from 0 to 16 hertz, and then 16 to 32 hertz. Keep going, 0 to 8, 8 to 16, 0 to 4, and 4 to 8 hertz. So let me stop over there. Right now, you might be thinking, why do they call this as time frequency analysis? He's only talking about frequencies so far. He didn't say anything about the time. Well, the good thing over here, while you are decomposing the original signal, dividing the frequency spectrum, you are also shrinking down the signal in time. So the resultant signal at this point would be close to almost like nearly half or slightly more than half of the original size of the signal, and another half over here. At this level, you will get nearly half of that and another half over here. So what you are really doing with the wavelet uh, transform is that you keep decomposing in frequency. At the same time, you are shrinking the size in the time domain as well. Um, the beauty of this will um, come when you uh, look at different applications. So in one application, which is related to EEG, neuroscientists usually look at a number of frequency bands within the EEG signals, like these bands, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, 
are pretty much well known to any neuroscientist. So for those guys, what they really need to do, they need to look at only this frequency range of the EEG, and they need to monitor the energy of this specific band or all of these bands while the subject is doing something specific. So the subject might be looking at a like a screen which display different um, items that he's trying to purchase. And this is the kind of thing that you do in neuromarketing research. Um, in another task, you could be asking the subject to think about a certain task like moving his fingers or forearm. And you can look at the different, uh, like the, the energy of the different frequency bands, trying to relate that to the movement maybe. So the beauty of these kind of analysis is that by decomposing the signals into one level, second, third, fourth, and fifth, if you look at the delta, the delta says it needs to cover the frequencies from 0.5 to 4 hertz. I already have something that is here that is 0 to 4 hertz. So realistically, I really only need to look at that signal over there because that covers the frequency of the delta with some extra bit from 0 to 0.5. So that's a good representative of delta. The second one, which is theta, goes from 4 to 8 hertz. Well, guess what? I have that exactly. So by analyzing the signal using the wavelet transform, I've created many signals that are focused within specific frequency bands. Now, how do you extract features from this? Well, remember, I said there is a signal representing each one of these blocks. So what you can really do is what? For example, take the energy of the signal, and that will be the energy of the delta band. And then take the energy of the next block, and that will be the energy of the theta band, and so on. So in this case, you will end up with a number of what? Of frequency bands and you can extract the energies or variance or standard deviation, waveform length, skewness, kurtosis, whatever feature you can think of, extract them all. See which one is more useful for your application. Now, by doing something simple as this, I was able to do filtering and shrinking, let's say, in time domain, and I focused my signal representation into these different frequency bands. But there's a small problem. What if I need alpha? If you look at alpha, it says 8 to 12 hertz. And by the way, before going further, if you are a neuroscientist, you might be disagreeing with me on the exact definition of the frequency ranges. I took these from Wikipedia. I know that the different publications will, um, let's say, display different variations of these bands, but this is general or rough estimate that everyone agrees on, kind of. So the problem over here, by using the wavelet decomposition, the wavelet transform decomposition, is that I don't have really a good representation of alpha because alpha needs to be from what? 8 to 12. I have 8 to 16. Is that acceptable for you? Well, you can use it. Why not use it? But it's not exactly covering that range. It's not really covering 8 to 12. What can I do? Like really over here, I wish if there was a way at this stage, you would be saying, hmm, I wish if there was a way, actually, if I could have decomposed the 8 to 16 into 8 to 12 and then 12 to 16, as if like the same thing that I did over here, because that will be decomposing this into two halves. It will be 8 to 12 and then another one from 12 to 16, and that would have solved my problem. Correct? So your wishes are our demand. Oh, it's commands actually. <laughs> so let's go to another tool, which is the wavelet packet transform. In this case, you are always going to start with a wavelet family, low pass and high pass. And you are going to decompose the left side and the right side. It's no longer only about the left side as we did with the wavelet transform. So you are going to decompose both parts. You keep decomposing every single child node. So remember we said these are families. As you can see, there are always two of them coming together. 
This is the father, this is the mother, and these are the children notes of this father and the children notes of this mother. So you keep decomposing now. I keep decomposing each and every single one of them. And as you can see, I'll keep going forward with this. So it will give me what? More control on the different frequency ranges. I can extract anything of interest to me. So the beauty of the wavelet packet transform is that it allowed me to look at the signal from a time and frequency point of view, but it also allowed me to extract features from what specific bands by doing some sort of filtering. So in this case, the example was um, a signal with 128 Hertz max. So we divided that into zero to 64. And now I have the right side, which goes from 64 to 128 Hertz. And then zero to 32, 32 to 64, 64 to 96, 96 to 128, and so on for the different ranges. So if you decompose here further, so I stopped here because I didn't have more space as you can see, but I can keep decomposing from zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12, 12 to 16, and so on. So I can have more control on the different frequency bands that are, that are of interest to myself for the specific problem. So by the look of this, you can see that you will have a lot of features for every single node. There is a signal waiting for you to process. So extract any kind of features that you are aware of that could be useful for this application. Let's imagine this problem where a subject is wearing a cap. There are 128 channels. So I'll be repeating, let's say the wavelet transform. Don't even go to the wavelet packet yet. Go back to the wavelet transform, decompose that for every single electrode because each of these electrodes will give me one signal. So one signal, and this is the tree of it, one signal, this is the tree of it, continue doing that until you reach 128 of them. In a problem with 128 EEG channels, where you're extracting six features per channel, and these six features are one, two, three, four, five, and six, because you don't need these anymore. Why you don't need them? Because these are covered. So the basic idea is that by decomposing the zero to 64 into zero to 32 and 32 to 64, and then decomposing further, you cover the different frequency ranges by looking at its children. So I cover zero to eight, this one, I cover it by using the two child, uh, like children, zero to four and four to eight. And the zero to 16, if I use this node, then I'll cover that range as well. Missing from the zero to 32, that will be then 16 to 32. So by using these and going in this way, I'll cover the entire frequency spectrum. So this is when considering the wavelet transform. Think about when you start decomposing the right side as well. And that's, you, in that case, you will end up with way more features. So in this case, where I'm using the wavelet transform, in a problem with 128 EEG channels, where I'm extracting six features per channel, the total number of features will be what? 128 channels times six features per channel. And that will be equivalent to a total of 768 features by using the wavelet transform. If you go to the wavelet packet transform, as I said, where you decompose the right side as well, not only the left side, this number will grow up significantly depending on how many decomposition levels are going down. So if you stop over here, for example, you will get less features, but if you keep decomposing because you need the specific range, which is the delta or theta or whatever of these ranges, you will end up with way more features. So what are you gonna do about it? Let's um, look at what you're gonna do about it. Basically, there are two approaches. In the old days, people used to optimize the trees using methods like the joint best basis that employs the entropy to judge on um, which if I should keep like the father or the two children. So there's a way where you can look at the entropy of each of the signals. 
like entropy of each father and the entropy of the two children. And then you decide, do I really need the children or do I just keep the father? Maybe I need to stop over here. I don't need to decompose further. There's like another method which was called at the time local discriminant basis, which use some sort of discriminant criteria where you do classification problems. It's very useful because entropy by itself doesn't tell you much about um, the classification problems like the entropy of uh, the signal only. And there was other measures like the one that I proposed by myself, like the fuzzy mutual information, which was available, which is still actually available on the MathWorks file exchange. But if you really wanna use something, let's say simpler, just track all the features, put them in a matrix and use dimensionality reduction, like PCA, LDA, ULDA, or any one of these dimensionality reduction methods. So it's totally up to you. But if you do feature selection, for example, you can have a more control of the different frequency bands. Like your features might be more representative or more meaningful in this case. So not only doing pattern recognition and like without, let's say, a proper understanding of the meaning of the different features. No, you can have actually that proper understanding by doing feature selection. So some Q&A. Usually people send me a lot of questions because I have my old files on the MathWork, uh, MathWork file exchange. So I have two functions there doing the multi-channel feature extraction using Wavelet and Wavelet Pack Transform. So I still get a lot of questions. Um, among these questions, uh, the first is how many level of decomposition do I choose? Um, the answer is usually it's up to you. It depends on your problem. It depends on your sampling frequency. It depends on your frequency ranges of interest. So it's really problem dependent, I can tell you. Um, you have to try a few parameters and see which one works the best for your problem. Which family or which wavelet family is the best for my problem? Simlet, DB, et cetera. Well, again, it's a problem dependent. You have to try a few of them and see which one gives you the best result for your own signals. I can't tell you use this specific family because will be different from one scenario to another, from one kind of data to another, and so on. What sort of representative features are the best? This is a like, question that people have been asking me for the last, let's say, 12 years or 13 years since I put the code on MathWorks File Exchange. I always tell them, look at the energy variance, standard deviation, waveform length, range, max, anything that you can think of. Basically, if you implement feature selection later on, it will tell you what are the most representative features. But if you do um, feature projection, you won't know, you just see, like basically you can know by looking at the weight of the matrix generated um, eigenvector matrix. But usually for more intuitive understanding like, or explanation, I would say use feature selection with these kind of trees. Um, Let's say um, another question that uh, people usually send me is that level one already covers the frequency range of level two, as we said, and level two already covers the frequency range of level three and so on. Why do I need to decompose into further levels? And when do I stop basically? So why do you need to, to decompose? Is the, the answer for that question, we already gave it when considering the example of the EEG signal. So if you want to look, for example, at the frequency bands of delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, you will have to decompose until you reach there or something very close to it. And then you say, I have something representative of that band, and I can look at the energy of it. So how many, or do you really need to decompose further? That's totally up to you and your problem. Again, it's a problem dependent. Can I extract the features only from the last level? Yes, you can especially with the wavelet packet. People have been doing that across the different knees because the last level of decomposition usually cover the entire spectrum or the entire frequency spectrum, basically. So you can use that. Yes, it's totally up to you. You don't have to, like for example, if you have the wavelet packet decomposition, if you go a few level, you can easily end up with 256 nodes if you use every single node. So you can use every single node, and that's something that I've been experimenting with as well for my own problems, because you never know which frequency ranges interact with each other in the best way. So extract everything, put them over there, do feature selection, and it will tell you which bands interact with each other in the best way. 
So in the example of zero to four, maybe zero to four like interacts with, let's say 16 to 20. I don't know. I have to extract and see to test it myself. Final question, do I need feature selection? Well, you definitely need a dimensionality reduction. It's either feature selection or projection. If you want to explain your findings to someone, then feature selection will be more useful to you, I believe. Um, just to give you a hint about something that came recently. So we have said that there was the wavelet transform, which was decomposing the left side of the um, transform only, like low frequency part, decomposing that only. And we said there was the wavelet packet, which was decomposing both sides, left and right, low pass and high pass. Recently, inspired by deep neural networks, or maybe deep neural networks were expired, inspired by those guys. So um, the wavelet scattering transform came out, which is a deep representation of the wavelet transform. So I would really um, recommend you that you go to this uh, specific article on Towards Data Science and read it. It's called The Convenet That Works Well With 20 Samples, the Wavelet Scattering. So the wavelet scattering is a deep representation of the wavelet transform that um, produces um, representations of your signals that are invariant to data rotation, translation, and are stable to def deformations of your data. It's one of the very powerful techniques. So instead of using deep neural networks, so what people are doing uh, still up like until today, when you are dealing with signals, you will find many people um, extracting the continuous wavelet transform or FFT or any other, other kind of representation, generating the images of the time frequency analysis, and then submitting these to deep neural networks like CNN or any other model. Alternatively, what you can do, instead of using continuous wavelet transform or something like that, straight away apply the wavelet scattering transform. So this is deep feature extraction. You don't have to then apply CNN. It's up to you. You can still apply CNN, but what you can do is that use wavelet scattering transform, again, which is a deep, let's say, neural network kind of representation, and then use classical classifiers. And I've done that recently for some real-time experiments, which I'll talk about in the future. And the results are really powerful. So have a look at this article, read more, and let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to support or help if I can. Thank you very much.